Hi, I'm Andy Mahoney. I'm a research assistant professor here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks at the Geophysical Institute. Uh, thank you all for turning up. Um, today, as you see from the title of my talk, I'm going to be talking about ice. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about sea ice, uh, sea ice in the Arctic, and why that's going to be uh, a prominent part of life for Alaskans in the coming decades. So this is an outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to start with introducing what sea ice is. I'm actually going to give some examples of what isn't sea ice as well, uh, just to clear up some confusion. I'm going to talk about why sea ice has been in the news recently, uh, particularly in the last few years. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the science and some of the data behind those stories um, before I wrap up with what, uh, what this means, what the science is telling us, what life is like, going to be like in Alaska um, with less ice around. So uh, to start with, what is sea ice? Um, and I have some, some sea ice here that we can, uh, that we can show you. Um, and it sounds uh, perhaps slightly simplistic to say that sea ice is frozen seawater. Thank you very much. And here I have uh, a block of sea ice. Um, this was formed in the, in the Chukchi Sea, north of Alaska. Um, and when seawater freezes, some of, the ice, some of the salt that was in the ocean is actually trapped within the ice. Um, on the screen here, uh, there's a, a, a close-up of what a, a really thin piece of sea ice looks like. And you can see, when you hold up a thin piece of ice, sea ice to the light, you can actually see the bubbles and the brine pockets that contain uh, the, the trapped salt. Now, if I compare that with a block of lake ice that I collected from a lake much, here, much closer um, to Fairbanks, we don't have sea ice near Fairbanks, but we do have lake ice, you can see that it looks quite different from the sea ice. The lake ice, you can clearly see my hand as I wave it behind uh, the lake ice, but the sea ice is, uh, is, is opaque. And the reason it's opaque is because of these brine pockets, it's because of these inclusions of liquid brine trapped inside the ice. And they clearly affect the optical properties of the ice, but they also affect the mechanical properties of the ice. Uh, for the same thickness, this piece of lake ice would be a lot stronger than this piece of sea ice, for example. Now, there are a lot of different types of sea ice, and I could give a whole talk about what they all are, but for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about later, I'd just like to mention that one type of sea ice is first-year ice. And in fact, this block of ice um, sitting up here uh, next to me is a block of first-year sea ice. That was ice that formed the same winter that I cut it out of the um, out of the Chukchi Sea. Uh, this is usually found around the edge of the Arctic in what's called the seasonal ice zone. And first year ice is defined as ice that has not yet seen a summer, or it's going to melt completely when summer does come around. Multi-year ice, on the other hand, has seen at least one summer. Um, it uh, it shows evidence of melt. And it will actually contain less salt, significantly less salt, than this block of, of ice right here. I, I didn't have a block of multi-year ice uh, to bring in, but you, you would be able to tell the difference between the, the multi-year ice and the first year ice just by looking at it. But they're also typically quite different in thickness. Multi-year ice, being older, is usually quite a lot thicker than first year ice. Another form that ice can take is pressure ridges. When two pieces of ice floating on the ocean come together, they pile up on each other and form like a mini mountain range in, in the middle of the sea ice. And sometimes these can be up to 40 meters thick. And what you see above the, uh, what you see on top of the ice, kind of like an iceberg, is only a fraction of what's below the ice. And so the keels of these really thick pressure ridges are actually a key consideration for navigation and safety in the Arctic. And a final type of sea ice that I'd like to talk about is landfast ice. This is sea ice. That's not drifting around in the Arctic, it's floating in, in, in places, but it's actually attached to the coast and it's stationary. And this is the type of ice that most people will actually encounter if they do encounter sea ice. You can walk from the coast onto the landfast ice typically, and the landfast ice is uh, what can offer uh, an extension of the land, uh, a means to travel over the ocean and reach hunting and fishing sites, uh, for example. So 
why should anyone care about the ice? Clearly, uh, I care about sea ice, um, but, but why, should, why should people in general care about sea ice? Well, there are a lot of scientists in the world who study sea ice. And a few years ago, uh, there was quite a big publication of all the, the, a lot of the sea ice researchers in the world contributed research to this uh, volume of research articles. And I took all of their words and I compiled them into this word cloud. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen word clouds before, but the way they work is that the larger the word in the cloud, the more often that word was used by, in this case, the scientists when they were talking about sea ice. And you can clearly see in the middle of this word cloud that thickness is really important to, to scientists. When they talk about the things they need to know about for sea ice, thickness is one of the key properties they're interested in. But you can also see that snow, extent, measurements, data, model, these are all key terms in the, uh, uh, the, the language of sea ice for scientists. So I'm going to expand on that a little more and uh, explain why scientists are so interested in sea ice. Well, one of the main reasons is uh, that it's a regulator of the Earth's climate. Sea ice has been called the Earth's air conditioner. Sitting high up at, at the polar regions, and, and this globe uh, looking down on the North Pole, you can imagine quite a similar view if you looked up on, on the South Pole as well. Um, we have a white cap of sea ice sitting on the surface. Now that white cap is going to reflect approximately 90% of the solar radiation that lands on it. So we have the red arrow coming down, and that's the solar radiation. And if that hits sea ice, 90% of that gets reflected back into space. And you can see that with the blue arrow uh, going upwards from above the sea ice. On the other hand, if the solar energy hits an open water surface, instead of 90% being reflected, 90% is going to be absorbed, and only 10% reflected. So clearly, there's a big difference between open water or sea ice. In, in terms of how much energy is, is absorbed by the Earth's surface. This, when, we, when, we, when you change the amount of sea ice, this is called the ice albedo feedback process. Albedo is the amount of heat or, or energy reflected by a surface. When you replace a sea ice surface with an open water surface, as in when the sea ice retreats, you absorb more energy, the Earth gets warmer, you melt more sea ice, and you increase the rate of retreat, and, and this is called, uh, this is an example of what's called positive feedback. The other way in which sea ice helps regulate the Earth's climate is through the thermohaline circulation. Uh, thermohaline uh, refers to temperature and salt, and <clears throat> the temperature and the salinity of the ocean are two of the key factors that affect how dense seawater is. Now I mentioned that when this block of ice froze, it trapped some of the salt that was in the ocean but it actually only trapped about a fifth of the salt. So that means that four-fifths of the salt that was in this block of ice got rejected back into the ocean. So that means the ocean underneath the sea ice is going to be cold because sea ice is forming, but it's also going to be very salty. And cold, salty water is going to be denser than what's around it, and it's going to sink. And so up at the edges of the ice in, in the northern regions, uh, in, in the North Atlantic, in this slide, for example, you have, and, and in the Labrador Sea, you have a lot of cold, dense water forming that is going to sink. Now, when that water sinks, it's going to need some water to come and replace it at the surface. That water comes in the form of warmer waters from the equator. And so ice formation is partly responsible for driving this global thermohaline circulation that takes water from the equator at the surface, delivers it to the poles, and helps redistribute heat. If we weren't able to redistribute heat through the ocean, the equator would continue getting hotter and hotter, and the poles would get colder and colder until they reached a, a new kind of equilibrium that would end up with a, a global temperature distribution a lot different from what it is now. So sea ice helps maintain, helps cool the poles, and in doing so, it helps cool um, uh, the rest of the planet as well. Now, sea ice is also an essential component of the ecosystem. Uh, th these two slides here show ice algae growing on the bottom of the ice. So this is like the, the lower end of the, uh, the trophic levels of the, of the food chain, of the food web. 
Um, and we also have a Weddell seal down in the Antarctic here, representing the, uh, the top level predator down in, in, in that region. So sea ice actually supports the entire food chain, right the way from primary production all the way up to um, top predators. And uh, the loss of sea ice is actually being considered a, a threat toward certain marine mammals uh, to the point where the polar bear, for example, is now listed as an endangered species. But sea ice is also very important for us, for humans. For millennia, sea ice has been used as a hunting and traveling platform by the, the native communities living in the Arctic, mostly in, in, along the coast. Um, during the 19th and 20th centuries, sea ice is also seen as an obstacle for shipping. Um, we have here an icebreaker sailing through, through the sea ice, um, and these people are going to want to find thick ice, whereas, of course, if you're traveling over the sea ice, um, you're probably wanting to find thicker ice. During the Cold War, sea ice actually turned to have to be quite good for hiding submarines, and a considerable amount of sea ice research that was done during the 50s, 60s, and 70s um, was done from submarine under the sea ice um, and was partly aimed at trying to see if you could detect submarines um, that were traveling in the polar regions. Um, and another important role that sea ice plays for coastal communities is the mitigation of coastal erosion. And it does this through reducing the size of the waves that you can find at the coast. And then when there's land fast ice present, um, it can actually help reduce the impact of those waves when they reach the coast. So when thinking about sea ice, especially when thinking about sea ice in the Arctic, you have to remember that the Arctic is home to four million people. And for these people, sea ice is a way of life um, and, and has been for, for generations. And so if you ask locals who live in the Arctic, who live on sea ice, if you produce a word cloud from their thoughts on sea ice, as we have here on the screen now, you can see that the words that they think are important are quite different than what the scientists say. We don't see anything about measurements or data here. Instead, we see water, dogs, bear, food, hunting. We see food, we see survival, we, we see a way of life. And so I'm talking to you here about sea ice as a scientist. But you have to realize that there is another way of knowing about sea ice. Uh, and that's the local knowledge gained over years and generations living with the ice. And I think that if you really want to understand what the meaning of sea ice is, then you should try and talk to an elder or a hunter in one of these communities where they live with sea ice on, on a year-to-year on -year basis. But I am a scientist. Uh, and so, um, with that in mind, I'm going to talk about some of the data that have been making news stories recently. Um, this plot here is uh, possibly quite familiar to many people. It shows the extent of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean or in the northern hemisphere um, over the last 30 or so years since we've been able to observe global sea ice extent with uh, passive microwave satellites. Now, these data have a clear negative trend. If we look at the most recent year, 2012, when we shattered the previous record, we're sitting at around 3.6, 3.7 million square kilometers, which is actually less than half of what we had at the maximum um, back in 1980. So in 30 or so years, we've lost half of the sea ice in the Arctic in summertime. There's some dispute about these numbers. People quibble about uh, differences that different algorithms produce in, in terms of getting slightly different numbers here. Some people discuss whether there's evidence for an acceleration in this trend. If you look up until about 2000, the data seemed to, be, seemed to show a, a relatively constant rate of decrease. And then after 2000, there's evidence for some sort of acceleration. This is where the scientific discussion is, what nobody is arguing at this point, that this decline is not real, that this decline is somehow due to errors in our way of, of observing the satellite, uh, observing the CS with satellites. 
this reduction is far greater than any error and is indisputable. However, it is useful to try and put these results in some sort of historical context. Now, we only launched satellites into space to look down on Earth in the 1970s. So we can't, go, we can't rely on our satellite data to go back any farther than that. But some of the oldest data on CMS that we can get our hands on is actually the logs of whaling ships that were sailing, uh, and in some cases uh, motoring under steam power, um, into the Arctic during the, the latter part of the 1800s and, and into the early 1900s. Now what these three panels on my right here show are observations in September from these whaling ships um, over three different 20 year periods. And the blue dots show everywhere where there was uh, a whaling ship that didn't report any uh, observation of ice. The white dots indicate those areas where ice was reported. And ice was a very important um, navigational hazard, so if any ice had been around, it would have been reported. Um, and the green dots show where they saw whales. Now, of course, whales were what they were after, so you can believe that every time they saw a whale, it was going to be written in the log. And whales are commonly associated with ice. That The bowhead whale that they were hunting is an ice-associated species and was commonly found near the ice age. Also shown on these three plots, uh, ice edges from an atlas that was created right at the turn of when we were starting to get global um, sea ice data. And so these, um, these lines, the red line, the solid black line, and the dashed black line, indicate where the ice was likely to be at the start of the satellite record that I just showed you on the last slide. And what this slide indicates is that the sea ice in September in the 1850s through to the 1900s was actually quite similar to what people were observing in the 70s and 80s. So the rapid decrease that we've had in the last 30 years appears to be unprecedented, at least in the historical record, that we can construct from whaling ship data. Okay, I'm now going to show you an animation that shows the retreat over the last 30 years, but also um, each, each frame is, is, a, is an image from a single day. And you'll see that the, the annual cycle of the ice retreating in summertime and expanding again in the wintertime. And um, Jim Maslanik from the University of Colorado and Chuck Fowler, who produced this data set, were able to keep track of ice from one year to the next. And in doing so, they were able to count how old ice was in, in certain parts of the Arctic. Now, on this slide, starting in 1979, they'd only been running the algorithm. Data were only available uh, just for a few months. So at this point, the only thing they could identify was ice that was there when the satellite was first turned on, and ice that has grown since. So the ice that was there is, well, it's at least second year ice and the ice that has grown since is first year ice. As the animation proceeds, and the ice contracts in the summertime, and then expands in the wintertime, each time it starts to expand again, for the first few years, you will see that we're able to add an extra year of data and, and keep track of ice that's at least one year older. And the animation is going to go through, and once we get to about six years, we're not counting beyond that, we're just saying that the ice is six years and older. And so you'll see the, the, the animation will spin up. We'll, over the first few years, we'll generate more colors. And then once we've hit the pink color, um, we're not going to generate any new colors. And instead, we're just going to watch how ice of different ages drifts around the ocean. Um, one thing I'd like to, to point out that you'll see in the data are um, where we lose ice down between Greenland and Iceland. Um, and a, a general clockwise circulation of ice north of Alaska and Canada. And I'll point those out again when we run the animation here. When we run the animation here. Okay, so the animation started, and you can see we shrunk down to the minimum, and we expanded again, and the ice in the middle changed color. And it's done that a couple times now. We've got green, yellow, and now we're on red, fifth year ice. 
one more year. Okay, now we're tracking ice that is one through six years old. And you can see that the oldest ice, the pink ice, is in the central Arctic where we'd expect it, and it's mostly concentrated up against northern Canada. You can see that where we lose the old ice, as I was explaining, you can see a flow of ice um, over the years that's leaving the Arctic between Greenland and Canada through what is called Fram Strait. You can also see, over the course of a, a few years, you can make out a clockwise circulation of sea ice in the area north of Canada and Alaska, and that is called the Beaufort Giant. And the drift of ice from Russia out through the Fram Straits and the clockwise circulation of ice in the Beaufort Giant, those make up the, the, the two main uh, components of Arctic sea ice drift. Now you can see as we get toward 2000 now, there's a lot less old ice in the ocean. What had been occupying the majority of the central Arctic is now shrinking down to a core area north of Canada and Greenland um, at the end of summer. And as we now come closer and closer to the present day, we're in 2003, 2004. 2005 was a year when we lost an awful lot of multi-year ice. So you'll see that, that volume after 2005, is uh, sorry, the area after 2005 is considerably reduced. 2007 was the previous record minimum year, 2008. And it's actually going to stop in 2011. So I don't have data for um, this most recent record uh, minimum CS extent. But you can see now uh, week 16, so that's uh, April, roughly the maximum CS extent in the Arctic. Um, very little old multi-year ice left. And the Beaufort Gyre, that clockwise circulation, is no longer complete. You can see that it's actually cut off in the middle there um, in the area sort of between Alaska and Russia. So that was 33 years of sea ice data on a day-by-day on -day basis. Tracking around, you can see the annual expansion and retraction of the ice and the, uh, the circulation of ice and, and aging. And then in the more recent years, how we're losing sea ice from the Arctic. So, talked a lot about sea ice. Um, why has it been in the news? Why are other people talking about sea ice? Well, one of the reasons is because there are cute critters like these walrus that rely on the sea ice. And uh, photos of walrus and polar bear have been in the news an awful lot. And so, <clears throat> last September, as we were approaching the, the sea ice minimum, I knew that the news was going to be starting to catch up onto this story. And so on September 12th, I went onto Google News and I typed in sea ice just, just to see what news outlets were talking about with regards to sea ice. And there were two stories at the top. And just to zoom in on what those were, the top story reported by Google News, Arctic sea ice hits record low. Uh, this was the Guardian, a British newspaper. Now this, was, this is what I was expecting to see. This was the sort of story that I was expecting to dominate the headlines as we're approaching the new sea ice minimum in September of 2012. However, the second most reported story, right underneath it, ice still delaying shell Arctic offshore drilling. Now, this would apparently, th this would seem like some sort of contradiction. We're at a record low, the sea ice is all retreating, and yet somehow sea ice is preventing shell from performing their offshore operations. So what's going on here? Is there a contradiction? Do the scientists have it all wrong? No, really what it comes down to is these two stories are talking about different scales. The top story is talking about Arctic-wide sea ice extent. The bottom story is talking about local sea ice conditions in the Chukchi Sea. And the two don't necessarily um, agree with each other all the time. There have been other occasions when the news stories haven't really gone along with the, the larger public thinking on what's happening with sea ice in the Arctic. With Google News, you can specify uh, a date range for your search. And so here, I can find all the news stories to just those that were reported between January 1st and January 31st, 2012. And for those who were here in Alaska at the time, you probably remember that ice uh, was causing complications for the delivery of fuel to the city of Nome in Western Alaska. So three stories came up at the top of uh, Google News. A Russian fuel tanker reaches Alaska town bound by ice. 
Workers pump fuel into icebound Alaskan port, and tanker encounters ice near Bering Sea Island. All of these indicating that human activities are somehow being uh, impinged by sea ice. People are having to deal with sea ice in an unexpected way to the point where it's newsworthy. So what's going on here? It actually turns out that this was a record-breaking maximum extent for sea ice in the Bering Sea. So once again, the local sea ice conditions do not always reflect what's going on in, in the global picture. And of course, there's a human story to this as well. This isn't just about sea ice. There were other reasons that um, no, it didn't get its fuel, and they had to wait until winter time. Normally, they try not to wait until winter because, of course, they know that sea ice is going to be there in winter. So they, they try to avoid this, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And so you're still going to have sea, uh, stories about sea ice. So <clears throat> one thing that starts to tell us is that the picture's not quite as simple. It's not just a matter of sea ice retreating in extent. So the sea ice extent, what we can see from these uh, passive microwave satellites, is clearly only part of the story. And in this photo here, even for those of you who probably haven't seen sea ice before, you could probably tell me that all the sea ice in this photograph is not the same. It's pretty much entirely ice covered, but not all the sea ice is the same. You'd probably even tell me that the dark ice is going to be thinner than the white ice. And so we don't just have to think about the extent of sea ice, we have to consider sea ice thickness. Uh, thickness times area gives us the volume, the ice volume. And this really is what scientists want to know about if they're going to try and determine what the state of sea ice is in the Arctic and what the trajectory of sea ice is in the Arctic. Now, right now, we don't have very good ways to measure sea ice thickness on a global scale. And so to get sea ice volume, we actually have to rely on computer models. And this is results from a computer model, uh, the Pyomass model. And this is driven by uh, climate observations, uh, climate models, and also observations of sea ice extent. And this shows um, data since 1979 through to 2012, so a pretty similar timeline to the graph I showed earlier, but this is forming a much straighter line. There are fewer ups and downs uh, uh, overall um, from year to year, and there isn't the indication of an acceleration that we saw at around 2000 in, in the previous graph showing sea ice extent. So sea ice volume appears to be a, a more constant signal and potentially a more uh, useful signal for, for interpreting what the future state of sea ice might be. But as I mentioned, we don't have a way to measure this directly at the moment, and we're relying on computer models. So how do we measure sea ice thickness? Now, uh, I'm largely a field scientist myself, so when I think about sea ice thickness, the first thing I reach for is my shovel. And I'm going to go out onto the sea ice, and I'm going to start digging out uh, the snow so I can get to the sea ice underneath. And I'm going to get my drill, and I'm going to make a hole through the sea ice so that I can lower a tape measure down. And we have these tape measures that have a, a toggle on the bottom that we can pull up and allow us to measure the thickness of the ice. Um, <clears throat> and I will also measure the snow depth while I'm at it. And two other things that are important to know uh, and are the draft of the sea ice, that's how much sea ice is below the waterline, and the free water of the sea ice, how much is above the waterline. Okay. So these are the four things that I like to measure uh, whenever I drill a hole through the ice. Um, but of course, you're also going to need to keep your eyes focused on what's around you, because you never know who might be trying to creep up on you. So I mentioned that the draft and the freeboard were important things to know about. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, and to do so, I'm going to bring up an old guy, Archimedes. Now, you probably remember him um, from the time he took a bath and jumped out of it because um, he had a great idea. Um, and whether that legend is, is true or not, Archimedes' principle says that the weight of a floating body, in this case ice, is equal to the amount of water displaced by that body. 
assuming the body is floating in water, that is, of course. So for our purposes, the weight of a piece of floating ice is going to be equal to the weight of the water that's displaced by it. We can rearrange the terms of this equation, and we can say that the ratio of the ice volume to the water volume is equal to the ratio of the water density and the ice density. And we can rearrange this a little more, and we can come up with an equation that relates the ice thickness to the freeboard, or the ice thickness to the draft of the ice. Now this turns out to be pretty useful, because sometimes you can't measure the whole thickness of the ice. You can only measure what's sticking up above the water, or what's sticking out below the water. Um, so without worrying too much um, about the, the, the symbols and, and what the densities of, of water and ice are, we can make some approximations, and it turns out that the total ice thickness is going to be around about 10 times the freeboard, or around 1.1 times the ice draft. We're going to focus on the freeboard for now, because that is how there's one way to measure sea ice thickness from space. So we have satellites flying over, the, uh, flying over the Earth. They look down with a laser, and they can measure the distance between the satellite and the Earth's surface very accurately. So if we happen to have a satellite that's flying over sea ice, and it flies over an opening, or what we call a lead in the sea ice, then we can get a measurement of the distance from the satellite to the ocean, and we can get a measurement from the satellite to the sea ice right next to that bit of ocean. And if we subtract those two, then we get a measurement of the freeboard. And so I would now like uh, to offer a demonstration using a piece of ice and uh, a tank which is going to simulate the ocean and a black piece of wood which is going to represent outer space um, and Stevie here who is going to represent a satellite. So uh, I'm going to use a piece of paper here just to lay on the surface so that the laser that we're going to use is actually going to bounce off the piece of paper rather than uh, penetrating into the water, which, which in this tank would, would be a problem for us. We wouldn't actually be able to measure the top of the water because the laser would go straight in. So Steve, if you can shine the laser on the piece of paper, and this is getting a measurement from outer space from the satellite to the ocean surface, which is A1 on the, uh, on the screen behind me. And that number is? 0 0.702 meters. 0 0.702 meters. We're going to call that 70 centimeters. OK, now we're going to repeat the experiment. I'm going to take this piece of paper, and I'm going to rest it on top of the sea ice. And see if you can take the second measurement. 0.691 meters. 0.691 meters, 69 centimeters. So we had 70 centimeters, we had 69 centimeters, we subtract those two and we get a freeboard measurement of roughly, uh, of one centimeter. So if we remember, our ice thickness was approximately 10 times the freeboard measurement. That tells us that from space, we would measure that this block of ice was around about 10 centimeters thick. Now, Steve, if you can confirm for me, using this highly technical tape measure, if you can try and get a measurement of that block of ice for me and tell me how thick you think it is. Well, there's, there's both inches and centimeters on that okay. measure, so if okay. you can... So that would be what, 12 centimeters on that side. 12 centimeters on that side. And you can see that this piece of ice here, it's not flat. And Stevie is actually having trouble getting an accurate measurement with, with the tape measure. Nonetheless, 12 centimeters is pretty close to 10 centimeters, what we measured using the laser. Um, and this demonstrates that it is possible to get an accurate, a measurement of CS thickness from space, but you have to bear things in mind. Thank you, Stevie. The bottom of the ice isn't always flat, and so your tape measure measurement might not actually correspond to the same thing you're measuring with, um, 
with the laser. You saw that I laid a piece of paper on top to stop the laser penetrating into the ice. Well, you can't always do that out in, uh, from space either. So um, the principle is sound. Um, a lot of people have uh, put a lot of time into this. Um, and it is possible to derive fairly coarse scale thickness maps of the ice in the Arctic from space using this same principle, uh, using a satellite to measure the distance um, to the ice surface, uh, using that to measure freeboard, and then making some assumptions about the density of uh, ice and water and snow um, and coming up with a thickness estimate. So this map here shows um, <coughs> thickness estimate for the Arctic uh, for the months of January and February back in 2011. And you can see um, kind of what we saw from the animation I showed earlier. The older ice, which we expect to be thicker, um, was against the, was sort of concentrated north of Greenland and Canada. And that is where um, Cryosat was showing the thickest ice to be found. The area north of Alaska, you can see is in those shades of blue, uh, up to three meters in ice thickness, um, but obviously thinner than what's north of uh, Greenland and Canada um, or in the Central Arctic. So this is a fairly coarse scale map of ice thickness in the Arctic that will be very useful for tracking how the volume of ice in the Arctic as a whole is changing over the, um, over the coming years. But it's not necessarily very useful for example for Shell when they're trying to work out if there's a big piece of ice that's going to cause them to um, have to halt their drilling operations. And so instead of flying a satellite, it is possible to fly, um, do the same exercise using uh, an aircraft. And, uh, and this map shows data from Operation Ice Bridge, which is a, an airborne laser mission to measure the freeboard of sea ice and ultimately sea ice thickness. Um, we don't get global coverage, we just get the coverage underneath where the aircraft flew. But you can see this map shows a fairly similar uh, picture to, the, to the, the satellite map I just showed you. The thickest ice is north of Greenland and Canada. North of Alaska, the ice is quite a bit thinner. But you do start to see there's a much more variability in this picture than we saw uh, in, in, in the large scale map that I just showed. And if we zoom in just to the area of the little box north of Alaska there, um, this next picture shows some other aircraft ice thickness observations um, <coughs> uh, carried out north of Alaska. And here we see that there's quite a bit of variability just within a short distance of the coast. The thickest ice um, on, on the transect flying north from Point Barrow there um, in, in Region 3 there's a zone of thicker ice close to the coast, whereas it's slightly thinner offshore. But the really striking thing about this map is the Hannah Shoal area, highlighted in the red circle, where we actually found ice thicknesses over 30 meters. Now this area, Hannah Shoal, is an area of shallow water where ice can become grounded and form a stationary island of ice that all the neighboring ice piles up onto as it drifts by. This area is known about, we expected to find thick ice there, that's why we went there. But what this map shows is that while the ice on Hannah Shoal isn't gonna contribute a great deal to the total volume of ice in the Arctic, it is only a few kilometers away, a few tens of kilometers away from where oil companies are planning to do offshore drilling operations. And so while the satellite data are very useful for looking at the big climate picture. If we want to be planning operations in the Arctic, we still need to consider the local picture, which as I mentioned earlier in the talk, doesn't always go along with the bigger picture. You, you have to be able to consider both at the same time. I'm just gonna show one more way in which we uh, can measure ice thickness, since ice thickness is so important to understand. Um, another way of doing it is to deploy buoys in the Arctic. Uh, and these buoys float around with the pack ice. Um, and these buoys are able to measure the thickness of the ice. Um, instead of using lasers, they actually use a, a, effectively a sonar 
to measure the distance um, from the top of the buoy to the top of the ice, and then underneath the water from the bottom of the buoy to the bottom side of the ice. And you can uh, do some simple arithmetic with these numbers and measure the thickness of the ice that the buoy is sitting in. These buoys drift around the Arctic. They are uh, connected to, they, they communicate with satellites and report their data back to us. Um, and at least, uh, at least back in January, um, this was the, the sort of measurements that we were getting. And you can see that the, uh, the thickest ice is uh, not necessarily found north of the, Ar uh, north of the Canadian Arctic, as we would seen in, in the previous maps. Now, partly this is an observational problem. One of the reasons that the ice is thicker in the Arctic, in, is thicker north of Greenland and Canada, um, is because the ice is constantly getting piled up in that location. And when ice is getting piled up, you're going to lose these buoys pretty quickly. And so what you realize is, I've talked about a number of different ways you can measure ice thickness. They each have their own advantages. This gives us real-time measurements but it's not going to be able to tell us what the ice in the thickest part of the Arctic is doing because we'll probably just lose those buoys when we put them in. So if we really need to understand the Arctic, we need to do all of these measurements, have them all going on at the same time, and be able to, uh, to interpret them. So that brings us to the question, what good are all these data? Um, there's a lot of people collecting data. Um, but, but, what uses are they being put to? One of the ways in which um, data are being used is to improve seasonal ice forecasts. At the moment, we're not very good at being able to predict, say, now in February, what the ice conditions are going to be like uh, during the, the open water season for shipping and, and potentially drilling in July and August and September. We have to rely on models to do that. And if we use real observations in these models, we can potentially improve the skill of those models in predicting what ice conditions are going to be like. So here <coughs> is a map with uh, three, uh, a, red, a green line, a, r a red line, and a black line. And this was um, some work done by Ron Lindsay. And he had a model for predicting what CS was going to do in September. And his model, when he ran it in April, suggested that the sea ice was going to retreat in September to be where the green line was. He then reran his model using data that were collected in April, the airborne data that I showed on an earlier slide. And when he used those data in his model, he got the red line, which actually showed that ice was going to retreat quite a bit more than he had originally guessed it would. Now, it turns out that the ice retreated all the way back to the black line. Um, so you can see that his model, including the data, didn't hit the nail on the head, but it was an improvement from his model that didn't use the real-time data. So improving seasonal forecasting, improving our ability to model the sea ice is one way uh, that these data are used. Another way they're used is to test existing models. Um, this plot um, shows the range of predictions from various different climate models for sea ice extent, uh, hindcasting going back to 1900, and forecasting going forward to 2100. And you can see there's an awful lot of variability, an awful lot of scatter in these graphs. How do we decide which ones to believe? Which ones are good? Well, one way is to try and select those models that actually match the observations the best. If they're matching the observations, then the theory goes that we've got the physics right in those models. Those models are accurately representing reality better than the others. So let's just take a look at those. And so in the red line, the fat red line in the middle with the arrow pointing to September 2012, those are the observations of CS extent that I'd shown you earlier from passive microwave data. And <clears throat> in, uh, in blue and yellow there are uh, mean measurements from uh, models that match those data the best. 
So if we just take those data, uh, those models that seem to be representing the observations best, and we use those to predict when we're going to uh, have an ice free Arctic, they suggest that sometime between 2040 and 2060, there's going to be less than a million square kilometers of ice in the Arctic. So the panel on the left shows sea ice extent in 2012, the, the record breaking minimum extent of 2012. The panel on the right shows the Arctic with 1 million square kilometers, which many people consider effectively ice free. And that is forecast to happen sometime between 2040 and 2060, potentially within the next 30 years. We could see an Arctic with less than 1 million square kilometers. And we're making that prediction using computer models and selecting the best models using the data that we've been observing uh, for the last 30 years. So bringing this back to Alaska, what does this mean for Alaska. What does this mean, for example, for the residents of Barrow at the northern tip of Alaska? Or other coastal communities um, around the state? Well, one thing that's pretty much agreed upon is there's going to be increased coastal erosion. More open water is going to generate bigger waves. So we're going to have bigger waves coming up the coast. We're also going to have less protection by landfast ice. Landfast ice has also been um, forming later and breaking up earlier um, than it has done in the past. So when these winter storms hit, there's no ice around to protect the coast either. So we have large waves hitting uh, a less protected coast. There's also permafrost in these cliffs. That's thawing as well. These are all related problems leading to increased coastal erosion. Sea ice is becoming less predictable. A lot of people in villages who've grown up with sea ice are starting to see sea ice behave in ways that they've not seen before. And that's meaning that their judgments are having to be a lot more conservative with regards to when the ice is safe to go out on, for example. Here's just a, a selection of clippings from a local newspaper on the North Slope showing ice-related stories where the ice did something that was not predicted and potentially led to whalers uh, drifting away on, on an ice floe that broke away. Um, problems bringing whales up onto the sea ice, which was too thin. Uh, sea ice actually coming on shore and colliding with a house. Um, and clearly you, you wouldn't build a house somewhere where you expected sea ice to, uh, um, to encroach on the land. Or even sea ice trapping sea, uh, seal hunters in Barrow during the summer. The sea ice has not been behaving in ways that it used to and is becoming less predictable for Arctic communities. The loss of sea ice is also going to mean the loss of habitat for marine mammals, and I mentioned this earlier. The US Fish and Wildlife Service lists the polar bear as endangered due to the loss of sea ice habitat. Earlier this year, bearded seals and ring seals were, list were added to the list of threatened species. And there's also a case under review currently for adding the Pacific walrus as a threatened species as well. While all this change is going on, there's going to be more interest in the Arctic. There's going to be increased marine access. Less ice is going to mean more ships. Um, that's going to bring with it a whole set of other uh, cultural um, issues as well. For many communities, increased shipping will actually mean improved access to goods and services. It might mean new industries, which might mean new jobs, but it's going to come with uh, cultural and environmental impacts as well, uh, changing the demographics of communities um, and potentially leading to the, the rise of other societal problems such as drugs and crime. Nonetheless, uh, Less ice in the Arctic, more shipping. This is uh, from the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment in 2009, showing the, uh, the voyages during that year in the Arctic. And this was in 2009, and there's been a considerable improvement, uh, a considerable increase since then. But here's the kicker. There will be ice. There will still be ice. Even though 
there's increased chipping, even though there's increased coastal erosion, even though there are walrus hauling out on the beaches, there will still be ice. We'll have to think about it. It'll come up, there'll still be ice in wintertime, but with people wanting to do, instead of seasonal drilling operations, people are going to want to do year-round operations. People are going to be dealing with ice more and more, even though the sea ice is retreating. So one example I'll just uh, end with here, Nome, Alaska, 2012. I mentioned this earlier. This was the, the news stories on, on Google News. The full delivery of fuel fell through for Nome, Alaska. By the time they were able to uh, arrange a new shipment, the harbor was frozen in. Sea ice in the Bering Sea was expanding rapidly. Um, but despite these obstacles, they were able to have the first wintertime fuel shipment uh, successfully without any, um, without the, any uh, event, any injury or any environmental contamination. Um, it turns out that the city of Nome, the Coast Guard, Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, the shipping companies, they actually all needed an awful lot of information about sea ice. They came to the university. Uh, I was able to go out and drill um, the ice and take some ice surveys for them. Greg Walker from UAF was able to fly unmanned aerial vehicles around uh, performing reconnaissance for the operation. The uh, National Weather Service Ice Center in Alaska was inundated with calls for ice charts. So even though the ice is retreating, events like this are going to come up more often. People are going to be asking about sea ice more and more. And I think sea ice is going to feature in the lives of Alaskans uh, more and more as the sea ice decreases in the years to come. So just to summarize the key points, the Arctic sea ice is in rapid decline, with ice-free periods in summer possible within the next 30 years. But there's still a lot of uncertainties about this. We still can't measure sea ice thickness very accurately on a large scale. And local variations in ice thickness can have a large impact on marine operations. And although the news stories generally focus on summertime, there will still be ice in winter. Um, so I will still have a job, but the impact of sea ice on Alaskans will still grow.